Hi, everyone. Israel, what on earth is going on? How important is Israel to the, to the new world ruled by Jesus Christ when he comes? Why do we hear so much about Israel? In fact, I think we should be hearing more about it. Today I want to talk to you about it and your part in Israel, what may be happening in the coming months and years for Israel, what you should be have happening in your homes, in your lives, right now in light of all this going on. I believe you're going to hear some things you needed to be reminded of or that you're glad to be reminded of and uh, catching up on all the news and the scriptures that do have to do with everything happening over there. So buckle in your seat belts. I've got a lot to cover. Most of you will hear something that will awaken your senses about the place of, that Israel holds in God's heart. And uh, keep in mind a few things, though. The Israel of the Bible was made up of 12 tribes, led in power often by Ephraim, one of the Joseph brothers. Joseph had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim, the younger son, became the dominant one. So when you read of Israel of Eph or Ephraim, uh, you may actually be reading about America, believe it or not. I don't have time in this talk to talk about proving that, but man alive, I cannot understand why the Bible would talk about Ethiopia and Egypt and so many other countries by name, but leave out America in the prophecies. Uh, they're there just by different names, Russia, America, China. So you may actually be reading about America, believe it or not. More on that later. When the nation we now know as Israel, of the modern Middle East, is being referred to in Scripture, often using the name Judah, one of the 12 tribes. So you had, they, they, they ended up splitting. So you had the house of Judah in the south and the house of Israel in the north. There were two nations. So the house of so if you read about Judah, you're here, that's when you're really reading about what we call today Israel in the Middle East. Does that make sense? So hello everyone, I'm Philip Shields, founder and host of Light on the Rock. Thank you for coming and uh, be sure to let others know about this website. It's free. Our goal is to have a closer walk with God, closer relationship to our Father and to our Savior and to be serving them, seeking them with all our heart, with all our soul and all our mind. And we focus also on loving one another. That's the second of two commandments, loving God with everything you've got and loving one another as yourself, especially now as we get closer, ever closer to the end time. Does that make sense? I hope it does. There's so much to cover, so much to get straight, straightened out from what you may be hearing in the media or even by some preachers. Where do I start? So it's going to be a little rambly more than usual. I spent a lot of time on it already, and I want to go ahead and get this done and get it out there. I'll mention some things you've heard about and some things you may not have. My main point is to show that what could be happening in the coming months and years for Israel in the Middle East and for Israel, the modern-day Israel of America, I think you'll be surprised. The real Israel, especially Ephraim and Manasseh, which are USA and Britain, what will be happening in the coming months and years and from a biblical point of view. Before I forget to say it, let me just say, as I said on my welcome page a couple of weeks ago, I, this is being recorded in, uh, what is it, October 19, 2023, because it's a very time-sensitive sermon. I thought it would be good for you to know that. But when I first posted my welcome page a week and a half or so ago, I mentioned that whatever you're seeing going on in Israel is coming to America. We've already had our 9-11. The, the recent events in Israel are like having 40, 35 to 40 9-11s. No kidding. Uh, based on their population and, and comparing it to ours. Imagine if in one day we had, well, even 30 or 20 of these 9-11s all in one day. Imagine that. So, we're going to talk about what the name Palestine, uh, where, where that came from, what's the recent history of Gaza. Uh, plus, let me add to all of you who are part of the spiritual Israel of God, how we need to really wake up, become zealous, repent of our sins, draw closer to God than ever before. On my Facebook page, I also, Philip Shields, I also um, reminded everybody to be 
remembering Psalm 122, 6 and 7, which says to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. When was the last time you did that? The peace of Jerusalem. So um, that's Psalms 122, Psalm 122, verse 6 and 7. And then verse 7, peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. Now, when we so terribly pulled out of Afghanistan the way we did, I imagine we had to pull out at some point, but the way we did, I gave a sermon back in 2021, in August 2021, about how God will use that to start to begin to break the pride of our power. Um, Look, look up that phrase in a concordance, may pride of your power, and you'll see how God warns us. Uh, our pride should be in him, his power, not our own power, but we are a powerful nation, but we're going to have that broken. So America, as mentioned many times in the Old Testament prophecies, as Ephraim, leader of the northern ten tribes. USA is part of Israel of old, in other words, is what I'm trying to say. I hope you've all seen my blog, is, is and where is Hamas mentioned in the Bible? It really is, H-A-M-A-S in Hebrew. It really is a mention by that name several times in Hebrew, look it up. And the Bible connects it solidly, solidly to Edom, Esau. Esau meant hairy, Edom has more the meaning of red. Uh, Esau was the twin of Jacob. Remember you have Abraham and then Isaac. And then uh, God chose Isaac over Ishmael, who became the father of many of the Saudi Arabians and other Arabians. And then you had, out of Isaac came Jacob and Esau. I believe Palestinians today are largely dependent from Edom, the Edomites of the Bible. You may want to look up the word Edom, E-D-O-M. Not the cheese, but <laughs> E-D-O-M, which was the other name for Esau does not end well for Edom in the Bible. Look at the book of Obadiah, and especially verse 10. The whole book, which is just one chapter, is about Edom. <clears throat> God views their attack against innocence, especially in Jacob, in Israel. It's something so horrific, God condemns them for that violence against their brother Jacob. The Hebrew word for violence is Hamas. Could hardly be coincidence. Read the blog on this website to be sure. Now, some are urging Israel not to go too overboard, but to keep it proportional. I think it's a, that's such a ridiculous word. I find it amazing. If Israel kept it proportional, that would mean doing an eye for an eye justice. That would mean they'd be burning Hamas children alive, raping their women, dragging some of their women over the streets, behind cars, like they did killing old and young alike, taking 200 or more hostage under terrible conditions. In other words, having the Jews do all that to them if you want to be proportional. No, none of that's happening. Israel doesn't do that. They drop thousands of leaflets, warning every time when an area is about to be struck as they target Hamas command and control structures and buildings. Anyway, so... Where do we get the word Palestine? Let's move around a little bit. Palestinian. There's some debate about exactly where those words begin or where they came from. And my wife and I even had to talk about it. Should we be using those words? I don't think we should, and I'll tell you why. In 132 to 135 AD, 135 years after uh, well, in, in the second century there, the, the Jews revolted against Roman occupation in the Bar Kokhba re revolt. It ended badly for the Jews. The Romans defeated them. And the Romans were tired of these uprisings. They had the one in 70 AD that resulted in the burning and destruction of the temple. Then, then 50 years later, they had this happen. And so they were tired of this. They want to get rid of Israel. They were... So they crucified an awful lot of Jews, sold thousands and thousands into slavery, banished them from their lands, expelled them from their lands. And Rome, in fact, wanted to remove the memory of Israel, to erase their name from existing. 
So Rome changed the name Judea, which was the New Testament word for the area we now know as Israel. The New Testament calls it Judea, because it's part of Judah, as I said. They changed that name to Syria, Palestina. So the area began to re be referred to as Palestina or Palestine. What or who was that referring to, Palestine? Most of what I've seen says it most likely was referring to the ancient powers that were there along the coast, the Philistines. I'm not saying that I believe, I'm not saying that I believe that the Palestinians are actual blood descendants of the Philistines. I, I, I don't think so. But the Romans were calling it the land of the Philistines, which was also a slap to God's face because God called it Eretz Israel. Eretz means land, Israel, the land of Israel, more than 30 times in the Bible. Even in the New Testament, Matthew 2, verse 20 and 21, Matthew 2, verses 20 and 21, God tells Joseph and Mary they could return now to the Eretz Israel, to the land of Israel. In Ezekiel 37, the vision of the Valley of the Dry Bones, this happens in Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. The massive Gog and Magog attack of Ezekiel 38 and 39. Uh, was against the land of Israel. So that's the name God gave it, the land of Israel. He gave it to Israel. In Scripture, therefore, Palestinian would be referring to modern-day Philistines, and the land of Palestine means the land of the Philistines when you use those terms. I think that's a slap to God's face. Say land of Israel instead, not Palestine. I'm not saying the Palestinians are descended from the Philistines, but their name is attached to it. Gaza, even back in Israelite days of, of old, became the center of much of the aggression against ancient Israel over the years, as it is even today. And remember, there has never been in the past few hundred years, certainly, no country ever being officially called the country, the nation, of Palestine. There never has been. It's never existed. There were times that they were connected or attached to Jordan or Egypt, but no, not a separate country. It's important you understand that. There's never been a Palestine, so there's never been land taken away from the country of Palestine. It never existed. Now Gaza, the strip of land on the southwest coast there, a beautiful beaches, was given up by Israel by Prime Minister Ariel Sharon in August of 2005. He came to believe, okay, we'll give this land for peace thing a try. Now keep in mind, God considers it his land, and he's not pleased with any world leaders giving up his land for peace or for any other reason. It's his land. We can't just take it, give it away. Ariel Sharon suffered badly for that, I believe, as struck by God. But anyway, my point is, so now this was their land. They owned it. It was theirs. Did that bring peace? No. They just used it as a base to start making more and more rockets and, and weapons against Israel. Anyway, I'll put in the notes that Joel 3, verse 2, God speaking, I'll gather all nations Bring them to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, whom, I, whom, I, whom they have scattered among the nations. So this is part of what I want to do today, too, show you that there are so many scriptures that tell us about God and Israel in the end times, a, a twofold description. The first part is that God is going to spank America and Israel, Judah, so we wake up. So we repent. The spanking is going to be severe. Some of us will be scattered among the nations. It mentions it right here in Joel 3, verse 2, whom they have scattered among the nations. And they've also divided up my land. And God is ticked off about that. Now, Ariel Sharon, Ariel Sharon did it for a land for peace deal. In 2007, that was in 2005, two years later in their one and only election, as far as I know, the people of Gaza voted in the terrorists 
Hamas to be their leaders. And ever since then, they have been in charge in Gaza. And ever since then, they've fired thousands and thousands of rockets against Israel. 5,000 just on October 7. So much for land for peace. Can you imagine if five rockets were fired into America by Cuba or by Mexico or somewhere else outside our country? How would we respond? So we can't self-righteously say, oh, come on, don't overreact. Thousands and thousands. Thank God they have the Iron Dome and something else called David's Sling. And now they have lasers that are able to knock these out. You may not have known about the lasers. They do. Powerful, powerful lasers. If you read all the scriptures about Israel and Judah, you will see that because of our sins as nations, because of that, many of our people will be scattered around the world. A strong punishment from God. But then as you read to the end of Joel 3, I gave you the beginning of Joel 3, and so many of the scriptures, you see that God ends up delivering us as he goes to battle against those who sold us into captivity. Now, on top of everything else, the Arabs and Palestinians don't really want, don't believe they want their own state coexisting alongside Israel. Anytime you hear the, the term the two-state solution, that's saying the Arabs will have their own country as Palestine, in other words, the West Bank and maybe Gaza, uh, and then there will be Israel. But the Palestinians won't accept that. They do not accept Israel as a, having a right to exist at all. You might have heard the chant. I, I forget how the whole chant goes, but it starts with, from the river to the sea, from the river Jordan to the sea. They want Israel totally gone. In, Ju in, in 2000, 23 years ago, Ehud Barak was prime minister, and he offered the PLO, he offered Yasser Arafat, an entirely separate state, their own country, the best deal they've ever had offered to them. He rejected it because he knew he'd never get away with it. The Arabs do not, in their manifestos and their documents, uh, what they believe, what they want, they never ever say Israel has a right to exist. I talk about the Arabs, especially around Israel. Arafat insisted that only the Palestinians could live in that land. There could be no Israel. In fact, if you see the maps produced by the Palestinians, there is no Israel in their maps. Did you realize that? In their schools. By the way, all this money, um, all this money being sent to Gaza and other places, that's supposed to be for schools and roads and water and sewage and infrastructure. All that's been commandeered. That was admitted by, by Hamas spokesman in Russia just within a week ago. They thought we were building schools. Ha ha, how stupid can they be in America? No, we use it to dig our tunnels and buy the cement that we needed to fortify those tunnels, hundreds of miles of tunnels, and to build rockets and homemade bombs and things and to buy them from other countries. And then when they get the rockets, they put them in schools and hospitals so Israel won't bomb them. Something else I want to bring up is constant criticism of Israel having apartheid. Apartheid means apartness, separation, based on racism. But that means you can't live where you want. You can't own property. You can't work where you want. You can't just come up and go and go as you please, come and go. You certainly couldn't be in politics in true apartheid and can't vote. You certainly could not be a member of the parliament. But keep in mind that 20% of Israelis living in Israel are Arab. By the way, I've spent four months in Israel. Twice I've been there. Total of four months. Those Arabs in Israel can be a member of the Knesset, their parliament. They can vote. They do. They can live in Israel. They do. They can start businesses. They can also join, be part of the Israeli military. And they do. They can live where they want. But Jews, Jews can't do that. 
Jews can't just move into the Arab cities like Ramallah and think they'll be alive the next day. Jews are not the ones implementing apartheid. The Arabs might be. The Jews are happy to have them have their own state. Many of them are. The Arabs aren't. Now, one thing you should also know, none of the surrounding Arab or Muslim nations surrounding Israel, none, you heard me right, none of them is clamoring to receive thousands of Palestinian refugees and to let them be assimilated into their own country of Jordan or Syria or Lebanon and not have to be confined to a horrible um, refugee camp. They're horrible. Egypt, as of this date, October 19, 2023, is still as reluctant to even open up the, the gates of the Rafa gates that heads into the, uh, into the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, they're very reluctant to open that up and to let humanitarian aid go into, is, to go into Gaza, like water and gasoline and medical supplies and so on. Israel's given their approval as long as Hamas doesn't grab it all. Hamas did grab water, medical supplies, and gas that the UN had on hand in Gaza. I don't know if you know that or not. Okay, let's keep shifting gears. I have a lot to cover. Now I want to talk about how important is Israel in terms of you and me in the Bible. Yeshua warned us, when you see the abomination of desolation that causes desolation, standing in the holy place, it sounds like a temple, then let those in Judea flee, Matthew 24, 15. On your own, compare it, write this down, to Daniel eleven thirty one and Daniel 12, 11, the abomination of desolation. Jerusalem is where the man of sin, the Antichrist, will set up his rule in the temple again. There does seem to be a temple coming. So in spite of how violent things are right now, we may find ourselves in a time of great peace. Second Thessalonians, coming up, not right away, but Second Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4, No one deceive you by any means that day, the day of the Lord coming, will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that's called God and that is worshipped. So he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Isn't that amazing? Jerusalem is where our King and our Lord, the Lord of our lives, comes back to and rules from. That's Jerusalem. It's going to come back to the Mount of Olives, which is just a block and a half east of the Temple Mount. And before he intervenes, though, we're told that Jerusalem's almost totally destroyed. I want you to note this. This is not being read by many who preach about how Israel's going to defeat every battle against it. No, they're not. They're not. In the end, they will. But many wars and battles that are coming up will be where Judah, where Israel, loses. And then, after a lot of suffering has gone on, God does get involved. Jesus Christ does get involved. But he uses the destruction and the defeats and so forth to wake up his people, to make them start praying to him again. So, for example, example, you know Zechariah 14 is a chapter about Jesus Christ or the Lord of hosts landing on the Mount of Olives. Acts 1, the angel said, this same Jesus whom you've seen go up is going to come down on this same mountain in Acts 1. So we know that part. We know the end of Zechariah 14. And how all nations will have to come keep the Feast of Tabernacles. But how often do we read the first two verses or have it read? The day of the Lord, this is NIV, is coming when your plunder will be divided among you. And I will gather all the nations. God will gather. Not Satan. God says he will gather all the nations to fight, to Jerusalem, to fight against it. Okay? And the city will be captured. The houses ransacked. The women raped. This is NIV. Ravaged, it says my new King James. Half of the city will go into exile. The rest of the people will not be taken from the city. Verse 3. 
Then, then, after all the nations fight Jerusalem, then, after the houses are ransacked, the city captured, women raped, and all of that, and half the people go into captivity and exile, then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. On that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, and so on. Uh, verse 9 goes on to say, The Lord will be king over all the earth. Now I mention that only because I know in Kenya uh, we have a lot of Seventh-day Adventists who are teaching, and of course they teach us everywhere around the world, that um, Christ comes back, collects his bride, they go back to heaven, and everybody on earth is killed. They're dead. And um, they go to heaven and rule from heaven for a thousand years, not on earth. But I'm saying right here, Zechariah 14, 9 says, The Lord will be king over all the earth. And not, not everybody is dead. A lot of people are dead. But there are nations that must come up and worship. There are nations that want to, in Isaiah 2 and Micah 4, come up and learn the ways of God after a while. So this thing you're being taught by the SDA is that the earth is empty, devoid of all humanity. There are some verses in Jeremiah 4 that sound that way, but when you put all the verses together, there are still millions of people alive. Maybe not billions and billions like we have today. Anyway, all the nations that remain shall be required to come to Jerusalem to worship God at the Feast of Tabernacles. I've said that already. And that's uh, Zechariah 14, verses 16 to 18. Uh, Micah 4, verses 1 to 3, many nations will flock to Jerusalem. Nations will flock to Jerusalem to learn God's word for themselves. So these obviously are not God's people who are flocking to Jerusalem. To uh, They already know God's way. This is talking about others who are repenting and want to learn. Remember the, the big statue in Daniel 2? that Nebuchadnezzar saw, the head of gold and the chest of silver and so on, uh, that they represented the major kingdoms that will rule the earth. Now, if you remember the story, Daniel 2.35, a great stone cut without human hands strikes the great idol image of the various kingdoms, smashes them. And then it says that stone, which is the kingdom of God, grows until it fills the whole earth. It's the rulership of God. The kingdom of God is spirit. Flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God. But this stone that pictures the rulership of the saints under Christ grows until it fills the whole earth. I asked a, a Seventh-day Adventist teacher the other day, if we're all up in heaven and all of God's people are ruling from heaven, who do we rule? Are we all chiefs and no Indians? Who do we rule? No, we're going to use that thousand years to study everybody's works and what judgment to give them and so on. Anyway, no, that's all baloney. In fact, now the whole Bible focuses on God, first restoring Israel and Judah, and then the Gentiles when the anointed one returns. The whole Bible, hang on, i got to see something, 28. Okay, hang on. The whole Bible focuses on God restoring Israel and Judah, then the Gentiles, when the anointed one, that means Christ, that means Messiah, uh, returns. The whole Bible is focused on God as our ruler and savior and redeemer, that's for sure. But he works through his nation of Israel. Israel. And there's the Israel of the Old Testament, there's the Israel of God in the New Testament, but it's still called Israel. Even the Son of God, Jesus, was a Jew. All 12 apostles were Jews. Likely. There may have been one or two that weren't, but I, it seems like they all were Jews. The early believers were all Jewish, Jewish converts. I mean, pretty much you had to be Jewish or else you couldn't. Uh, Jesus even said, don't go preaching to the Gentiles or to the Samaritans. Uh, preach to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Later, after the uh, resurrection, that was changed. But all the world... In the New Covenant, even Jews had to pledge their allegiance to their own Yeshua, be regrafted back into their own tree. Let me say it another way. In the New Covenant, even Jews who are Jews by birth, in God's eyes, according to Romans 9 and Romans 11, 
in God's eyes, are not true Jews. They're not. You, you have to accept Jesus nowadays to be the true Jew, according to Paul in Romans 9 and 11. Uh, study Romans 11, especially in several translations, to make Paul's language a bit easier to understand. The Jews, considered branches on the olive tree, were cut off to make room for the Gentile branches to be grafted in. And then Paul explains that even Jews who were cut off could be regrafted back into their own tree, but only after they come to believe in Christ. Romans 9, verses 6 to 9. These are important things for you to understand, which will bear into today's whole message. Romans 9, verses 6 to 9. But it's not the word of God that's taken no effect. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children, children of Israel, because they are seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, the Jews, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. So he goes on to say in Galatians 3, for example, um, let me write this down, Galatians 3, I think it's 26 to 28, that um, there's no more Jew, no more Gentile. We're all one in Christ. But it has to be in Christ. Romans 11, verses 23 and 24 and they, the Jews, also, if they, don't, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God's able to graft them back in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, to talk to the Gentiles, and you were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are the natural branches, he's saying the Jews, how much easier, how much more will they be grafted back into their own olive tree. That's Romans 11, verses 23 24. Even when the new Jerusalem is revealed to us, and it has three gates on its four sides, I want you to think about this. What were the names on each of the gates? They were the names of the tribes of Israel. So even to come into the heavenly Jerusalem, you had to go through Israel. Of course, we come through Christ. But I'm just saying it's interesting that the gates were named after the tribes of Israel. They aren't mentioned as Russia or China or Egypt. <laughs> no. So if you have any anti-Semitism left going on, hey, get over it. It won't bode well for you to hang on to it. Let's review some more recent news. You're all very aware, October 7, Hamas attacked. October 7, 2023, in the early morning hours, about 6.30, on the eighth day, holy day, right after the Feast of Tabernacles. And they targeted civilians. I think they also went and took out an army base where the soldiers were still asleep. Uh very sadly, but other than that, they were targeting civilians. They also surprise attacked that army base, I said. We know now that at this date probably will rise 1,400, mostly civilian Israelis, were slaughtered. This is the largest slaughter of totally innocent civilians who were either asleep or celebrating a party or dance about peace of all things. It was on the eighth day. It was on God's holy day. They should have been worshiping God, keeping the Sabbath instead. Maybe some of them will wake up and see that, understand that, that that's the case. We'll see. But you just don't go slaughter a bunch of kids who are dancing. By kids, I mean teenagers, young adults. Hundreds in the party were slaughtered. 1,400 in one day. This includes entire families. If you aren't watching the news lately, you're probably missing a lot of what I'm about to say in the next five minutes. Entire families were trying to be safe in the safe house underneath their house. They all have those. But they instead got burned alive in their own homes. Nine-month-old babies were decapitated, had their heads chopped off. Women were dragged, sometimes naked, they were dragged off behind cars in Gaza when they were taken hostage. 
Some were raped and some were even dragged behind the cars. In the streets of Gaza, while people celebrated and rejoiced and clapped their hands and cheered and hit them. Old people in wheelchairs were not spared. Children were not spared. Some were beheaded. Some were burned alive. We know about 200 were taken captive as hostages, maybe 13 or 14 Americans. Those hostages came from about 40 other nations besides Israel. We also know that among the 1,400 were a few Arab Israelis. 20% of the inhabitants of Israel are Arab. Some have called Hamas's barbarism and savagery being like animals. I disagree. That's much too harsh on animals. Animals can be very violent and bloody. I've seen many, many videos and watched them. I've never, ever heard of animals all savagely beating, killing, shooting, raping, burning, beheading 1,400 people or Israelis in one day. Ever in history, I've never heard of such a thing. They might kill and hurt a dozen, but they don't kill 1,400 humans that way and burn them and behead them and all that and leave them there. Please understand, there's no equivalency going on here either. Only one side targeted civilian kibbutz, kibbutzim and villages. They're saying Israel is doing it now with civilian deaths in Gaza when they bomb. But that's those who don't heed the warnings to get out. We're about ready to bomb this place. Or the Hamas is keeping them from being able to leave. I'm, did you know that? They put up barricades on streets trying to stop people from going south like they've been advised by Israel. Only one side burned alive entire families. Only one side cut off babies' heads. Only one side dragged women in the streets and raped them. Only one side cut off the heads of 30 to 40 Israeli babies right in their own homes. So anyone protesting on the side of the murderous Hamas should be ashamed of themselves they're siding with absolute terror and be like siding in with the Nazis after discovering the death camps of Auschwitz and Treblinka and others. And now Israel does have to eradicate Hamas. They can't just let them go on. Many Israelis will die. Many Hamas will die. Civilians on both sides will die. That's the nature of war. When we carpet bombed Dresden, wasn't it Dresden? Uh, Hamburg, maybe, but Dresden, I think, in Germany. I mean, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of deaths by the bombings that American Britain did. But they had to end the war. When we dropped the bombs on Japan after the first one, Hirohito still said, no, he's not going to surrender. So they dropped the second one. And we realized that if we didn't do it this way, though, an incredible number maybe 170,000 or 160,000 total between the two cities we would die instantly. We would probably have lost a million of our soldiers trying to take over Japan. And the Japanese themselves would have suffered very, very much higher casualties. So anyone protesting to side with the Hamas should be ashamed of themselves. Israel was even falsely, just lately, accused of bombing or rocketing, miss, sending a missile attack on a hospital. That'd be the last thing Israel would want to do when they're trying to get world acceptance that they need to go back after Hamas. Would they ever intentionally bomb a hospital? Now we know we have evidence. I've seen the videos myself. I've heard the phone conversations myself between Hamas members admitting that in fact it was a failed rocket attempt by a subgroup of Hamas called Islamic Jihad. They were trying to fire a powerful rocket, probably to Tel Aviv, and it backfired and fell down near the compound where they sent it up, right behind the hospital. Dozens were killed, not three to five hundred, but dozens were killed. It was their own rocket that did it. 
I saw the film even by Al Jazeera that showed it before they took it down. It's been, it was confirmed by U.S. intelligence and satellites. And in the phone conversations, the Hamas guys are saying, what? It was our rocket? Really? And uh, they had to admit, yeah, it was our rocket. The shrapnel was all Israeli shrapnel. It was not their own shrapnel. So they know it wasn't their rocket. I mean, it wasn't the Israeli missile. That'd be the last thing that Israel would do. But what did the media do? What did MSNBC, what did CNN immediately say? They took the news as if from Gaza Ministry of Health was reliable. That Israel has just bombed the hospital. 500, 3 to 500 are dead. Folks, the Ministry of Health in Gaza is Hamas. We can't trust them or believe them. Their death toll reporting is to garner sympathy. Now, because Hamas uses their own children and people to human shields, we have to be careful where we go. All the death right now on both sides was initiated is because it was all initiated by the Hamas attack of October 7. That'd be equivalent to having 35 to 40 9-11s all in one day. Now, because we know that Islamic Jihad need more training on how to fire rockets, we now know that they can have other errant rockets that go the wrong place. It could land right there in Gaza, or it could end up landing on the Temple Mount unintentionally, destroying Al-Aqsa Mosque, destroying Dome of the Rock. Or imagine if, if they assassinated the Prime Minister Netanyahu. Everything can change very quickly. By the way, Benjamin Netanyahu, Benjamin in, in, in uh, Hebrew, Benjamin Netanyahu, in, Benjamin means son of my right hand. Netanyahu means God's gift to man. I just wonder if that's just pure coincidence or we're going to see something unusual about that name coming to life, coming to show us something. The son of God's right hand is Jesus. God's gift to man is Jesus. Is God going to use Benjamin Netanyahu for something yet to wake up Israel? I don't know. But I just think it's strangely coincidental to have such a name. Anyway, I'm not saying it is of any significance, but just watch. So right now, it's just a cauldron of fire and disaster over there. Please understand. Understand what I'm about to say. If Israel gave up all their weapons, all their planes, all their bombs, all their missiles, all their rifles, and everything they have, I believe within two weeks the country would cease to exist. However, if the Muslim world and the Palestinians gave up all their weapons, there would be peace between them and Israel. That's the difference. Golda Meir, who served as Prime Minister of Israel late 60s, 1969 to 74, she said that the Israelis have a secret weapon. We have no alternative. In a war, the Syrians can go back to Syria. In a war, the Egyptians can leave the Sinai Peninsula and go back to Egypt. We have nowhere to go. And then she also said there will be peace in the Middle East between Jews and Arabs when the Arab mothers love their babies more than they hate ours. So they now have 200 hostages, Hamas does maybe more. I don't know how many are still alive. We know women are being raped. Blood was seen running down one poor woman's legs after such a horribly violent ordeal. Why am I addressing all this? We've already had 9-11 in America. Much, much more is coming. God is going to do a couple things with the nation called Israel, which was ancient Judah, and the other one that is Israel is America, called Ephraim in the Bible, leader, leader of the northern ten tribes. He's going to spank us for our disobedience and make us wake up. And then secondly, when enough of us do repent of our sins, God will then fight for us. But not until then. There will be a lot of suffering first. Ephraim and Manasseh, the two sons of Joseph. I believe for many years now that America is Ephraim, not Manasseh. America is Ephraim. 
Ephraim was the younger brother, like USA is younger to England. Ephraim was designed, I mean, destined for greatness, far greater than Manasseh. USA has been far greater than Britain for the past 70 years. Ephraim became a company of nations. That's exactly what United States means. It means United countries, United States. That's how I see it. So when you read of Ephraim, you're really reading of America. Scripture is clear. What we see happening in Israel is definitely coming to America soon. We have a wide open border in the south. There's also the border in Israel's south. Our open southern borders have allowed 8 million foreigners who are mostly unvetted. We have no idea who they are. A stupid, stupid thing we're doing. Or our government's doing. 8 million to pour across that we know of. And we know that just this year alone, 2023 alone, 18,000 of the illegals coming in are from China. 18,000. You heard me right. And then we let them go wherever they want in the country. Are we so stupid or what? Plus thousands more from Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Russia, Syria. The worst ones are the gotaways. Got away to where? What are they going to do? This is a report from Senator Danes. He's from Montana. I believe it's Montana. Somewhere up there. Since the 1st of October this year, just in the last 10 days, Border Patrol agents have apprehended individuals from, in 10 days, all our wonderful friends from Afghanistan, Algeria, Bahrain, Bangladesh, Egypt, Indonesia, Iran, Iraq, Jordan, Kazakhstan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Libya. Notice how many of these are Muslim. Malaysia, Morocco, Oman, Pakistan, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, Tajikistan, Tunisia, Turkey, Uzbekistan, Yemen, plus Malaysia and North Korea in the last 10 days alone. Remember, we're being called the great Satan. Israel's being called the little Satan. We're in their crosshairs. They're being set up right now as I speak, forming cells all over the country, waiting to be activated so that we start seeing incredible terrorism in our own country. That's why you must now spend the rest of your time seeking God with all of your heart. Asking him for protection for you and your loved ones especially. Asking for his mercy on our country. I guarantee that most of you will hear things today in this teaching that you're not hearing elsewhere. You watch, the UN will eventually come out real soon, very strongly against Israel, which is Judah. Especially now that many of them do believe the Hamas claimed that it was Israel that hit the hospital. In spite of Israel's evidence to the contrary. Hamas just keeps launching more and more rockets even as the bombs from Israel against the Hamas militant targets. I see them where they're bombing and right next to where they're bombing are missiles going up against Israel. They don't stop. Anyway, I really hope it doesn't hit a place that will change history forever. Thank God Israel has the Iron Dome. And then they have something for longer distant missiles called David's Sling. But imagine if just a handful of rockets were fired against the USA from Mexico or Cuba, how we would take that. We wouldn't. Now, shift gears again. How and where did all this hatred for each other come from? I want you to know that many of the Arabs are related to Israel. The ancient name of Israel was Jacob. He was renamed Israel by God. You know Abraham had a son named Isaac. And then Isaac with Rebekah his wife had twins, Esau, 
which means hairy, like hairy arms. Hairy, he was also called Edom, E-D-O-M, meaning red. Like Adam means red dirt, Edom is very similar. And Jacob, so they had twins, Esau and Jacob. God prophesied to Rebekah and to Isaac that the younger son, Jacob, would become predominant, preeminent. That's in Genesis 25. I would recommend that all of you, to really understand what's going on, that all of you read Genesis 25 to 32 at least, maybe all the way to 35. Genesis 25 to 33, read those chapters. Understand Esau, it's probably the Palestinians and other Arabs. Esau despised his birthright. He was so hungry that he says, I'll give you my birthright, Jacob, if you just give me a bowl of that lentil stew that you're making. That's in Genesis 25, 34. You can write this down and look them up. Hebrews 12, verse 16 and 17 says, Esau despised his birthright and sold it for a bowl of lentil soup. I say to all of us, we have a birthright promise. We have a birthright promise. Are you being so careless with it by not seeking God with all your heart? And I preach to myself. Are we, in effect, selling out our birthright as well as part of the first fruits? Are we selling it out for the equivalent of a bowl of lentils because we can't overcome a particular sin? Or we give in to this or give in to that. Or we can't obey or we can't submit or we can't love one another. We can't forgive or control our temper or whatever. And I preach to myself as well, like I said. So anyway, so Jacob got the birthright, and he took the birthright firstborn blessing as well, which once it's spoken cannot be rescinded. That's in Genesis 27. He was really, really sneaky about it. And his mother, Rebecca. They should have trusted God. God would make them wait till the end. And the last second probably have changed things to Jacob's advantage. But no, they took matters into their own hands. And when we do, it causes a disaster when we don't obey. Jacob later was renamed when he was wrestling with the angel of the Lord, the one we now know as Jesus. Because Jacob said, I've seen God, yet I still live. That's all in Genesis 32. While they're wrestling, the angel of the Lord says, let me go, it's daybreak. Jacob said, not until you bless me. And so God, the angel of the Lord, the messenger of Jehovah, said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, supplanter. Your name shall be Israel, prince of God, prevailer with God. And from that time onward, Esau, also known as Edom, has taught their children that they were robbed and their descendants were robbed through Israel ever since. A grandson, I think it was a grandson of Esau from a concubine, was Amalek, particularly disliked by God. And God told Moses to be sure that all Amalek should be wiped out. Not a man or a woman or child left. They all needed to be gone. God's words. They notoriously killed stragglers, old and infirm of Israel, as they headed to the Promised Land. God did promise the land to Israel, not to Edom. What were the original boundaries that God gave to Abraham's descendants? I'll give you three scriptures in my notes. Genesis 15, verses 18 to 21, the other two scriptures in Deuteronomy repeat it. On the same day, Jehovah, the Lord, made a covenant with Abraham, or Abraham at this point, Abraham, saying, To your descendants I've given this land, from the Eger, e river of Egypt, the Nile, to the great river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Ketni, all these other ites out there, Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. You can have all their land from Nile 
to Euphrates. In today's maps, that would include today all of Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, and a huge part of Iraq, probably, maybe even part of Saudi Arabia. Isn't that amazing? If you're still not convinced, Moses reminds them in Deuteronomy 1, verses 5 to 8, on this side of the Jordan, the land of Moab, Moses began to explain the law, saying, The Lord our God spoke to us in Horeb, that's Mount Sinai, saying, You have dwelt long enough. Get moving. Um, I've given you all the land in the south and on the sea coast, that's where Gaza is, to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon, as far as the river Euphrates. And you shall possess that land which the Lord swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and gave to them and to their descendants after them. God was going to kick out all the rest because of their evil deeds. They were burning their children alive to Molech. They had all kinds of idols and violence. God said, enough is enough. Deuteronomy 11, verses 22 to 25 is another one. Now, so God says, I want you to get rid of them completely out of the land, all the way to Euphrates. But... Israel, in this case under Joshua, did not fully obey. You can read the end of Judges 1 for yourselves. And tribe after tribe is listed. And Manasseh didn't drive the inhabitants out of blah, blah, blah. And Ephraim didn't. And Reuben didn't. They quit driving out the Canaanites and let them live there and become thorns in their side. God, through the angel of the Lord, which was Jesus, was displeased with them that they didn't complete the job. Not even Joshua did. Are you following me? Judges 2, verses 1 to 4, Then the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I led, I led you up from Egypt. You, we know that was God. And brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you but you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land you shall tear down their altars you but you have not obeyed me god gets furious when we don't obey him he says why have you done this therefore i also said i will not drive them out before you they shall be thorns in your side their god shall be a snare to you and so it was when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to the children of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. So the promised land, the holy land, became known as Israel, Eretz Israel, given to them by God way back in the days of Joshua, after a war of seven years, around 13th century B.C. I should have looked it up, but that thing's pretty close. Israel took over the land, the cities, the houses, the land, everything, of the Canaanites. They were not taking the land of the Edomites. It was the land of Canaan, mostly. That land was highly contested over the centuries. Various kingdoms ruled over that land for thousands of years. In the last few centuries, the Ottoman Empire of the Turks was ruling that part of the world, collapsed in World War I, the land came under British control, we had our Balfour Declaration in November 1917. Finally, a homeland for Israel was started. They'd gone on about 1,800 years before that without a homeland, without a country. Israel became an official country in May of 1948, immediately went into war with, I think it was six other nations, Arab nations, all at once, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon. And even a contingent from Saudi Arabia showed up. They were defeated. Israel increased their land. Then the Yom Kippur War of 1967, the Six Day War, against Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. That's where Israel won the war over the West Bank and they took control back of Jerusalem. And they got the Golan Heights from Syria. I think it was that war, yeah, that they got the Golan Heights and Gaza. And then October 1973 war, we were there in 1973 in the archaeological dig, got out just in time. This was a stronger performance from the Egyptian and Assyrians, but they still lost. 
So, a lot of people are killed. Gold in my ear, I may have said this already, we will have peace in the Middle East once Arab mothers love their sons more than they hate our sons. So now where are we? Don't let yourself be troubled. Don't let yourself be troubled. We can have perfect peace. Look at Isaiah 26, 1 to 4. Isaiah 26, 1 to 4. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation which keeps, which keeps the truth may enter in. You will keep him in perfect peace. Isaiah 26, verse 3. I love it. You'll keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For in Yah the Lord is actually saying in Yah Yehovah or Yah Yahweh is everlasting strength. So we can have peace no matter what's going on. If we're praying and seeking God, letting his peace come upon us. We have to let his peace. We have to keep our mind stayed on him. We just read it. 2 Thessalonians 3.16 May the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. But before it's all settled, there's some very tough times that will be coming to Ephraim and to Judah, to England, America, and to Israel. I've already read to you Zechariah 14, where it says that the nations will all be gathered against Jerusalem and destroy it. And they'll rape the women and send half the city into exile. On your own, read Psalm 83. Please do. It's a list of nations that will come up against Israel. Verse 4, uh, Psalm 83, verse 4, they have said, Come, let's cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. They form a confederacy, verse 5. Verse 6, the tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, that may include Saudi Arabia, Moab, that's Jordan, and the Hagrites, Gabal, Ammon, that's Jordan, Amalek, that's Palestinians, I believe, Philistia would be the Hamas in Gaza, with the inhabitants of Tyre, way up north, that would be your Hezbollah. Assyria has joined with them, and they've been helped by the children of Lot, Moab and Ammon. Deal with them. Okay, it goes on from there, just saying that it can be very, very rough coming ahead of us. So what are we to do? We, the spiritual Israel of God, it's mentioned in Galatians 6, spiritual Galatians 6, spiritual Israel, Israel of God. We, whether you're black, white, yellow, red, whatever you are, we need to be forming the strongest bond with God ever. We need to spend more time on our knees more time than we do at the gym or on social media and we have to read Luke 21 just write it down Luke 21 29 to 36 Jesus saying when you see certain things happening when you see leaves coming on the fig tree know the time is near and verse 34 Luke 21 34 take heed to yourselves don't let it be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and the cares of this life and that they come upon you unexpectedly. It will come like a snare. Boom! All of a sudden you're trapped. You had no idea that was there. On all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Luke 21, 36. Watch therefore. Pray always. Pray always. That you may be counted worthy to escape all these things. Which shall come to pass. And to stand before the Son of Man. We are promised some degree of protection, it does seem. Revelation 12, verses 13 to 17. Satan attacks God. He's cast down. Revelation 12, 13. Now when the dragon, that Satan, saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. The woman, the church is always called a woman, was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place. Don't be worried about how you'll get to a place of safety. I believe there's one main place of safety, 
But as you'll see, there are others who don't go, and they'll be scattered all over the world. So that's why when Jesus said he sends his angels and they gather his elect from the four winds of heaven, from all over the earth, because some will be those in place of safety from one place, and quite a few will not be there. They will be scattered all over the earth. Let's read it. Romans 12, verse 14. She's given the wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness where she's nourished for a time, time and a half, for three and a half years from the presence of the serpent, from Satan. So serpent goes out and tries to knock him out with a flood or an army or whatever that flood represents. Maybe a literal flood or maybe an army. But the earth helped the woman. The earth opened its mouth, swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. So the dragon was enraged with the woman, said, I can't have those. He went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God, who keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, we can either choose to be protected by God, by being so close to him, or we can choose to be laid a sea and type, lukewarm, lazy spiritually, and have Satan be allowed to put us through the great tribulation of terrible time. Revelation 3, verse 10 to 12, talking to the uh, Philadelphian type of people, one of the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3. Because you've kept my command to persevere, I will keep you from the hour of trial coming upon the whole earth to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. I will keep you from the hour of trial coming upon the whole world. Because you kept my command to persevere. You didn't give up. You didn't say, oh, what the use? Daniel 12, verse 1, the time of the end here. At that time, Michael, the archangel, shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, tribulation, such as never was since there was a nation. Oof. Even to that time. And at that time, I want to be spared having to go through it, guys which means I've got to be zealous. I've got to be seeking God with my whole being. I've got to be repenting. I've got to be listening to the correction you receive from the ministers. Apply it to your lives. There shall be a time of trouble such as there never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone found written in the book, probably the book of life. So be on the right side of history. And Israel, America, it's time for you as a nation, as nations, to repent, to awake to what's about to happen. Some terrible things are happening, are going to happen here in America very soon. We let our guard down. We let everybody in, the Chinese, the Iranians, the Iraqis, the, the Houthis. We let them all in. They're all being settled in all the cities of America. It's going to be horrible when it starts. So be on the right side of history and be seeking God with all your heart. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we know you love us with all your being, with all your heart. We know that as a father, you also need to sometimes spank us, spank the nation, spank us. But you also said in Second Chronicles that if we, your people, would repent of our sins, turn from our evil ways, and look to you, that you will recant what you wanted to do as punishment. If enough of us as your people will seek you, please, Father, help us do that. Please, as gently as you can, Awaken us to you. Please help us study more. Help us pray more. 
Help us evidence your joy and peace. Help us share your word. Share the gospel with neighbors and friends and family. Make disciples of all nations. Please help us be stronger, Father, through Jesus Christ. Yeshua, Jesus, someday we hope to marry you. So, of course, we talk to you as well as the Father. And we ask you, come live in us. Be our life. Be our thoughts. Be our actions. Convict us when we're doing things that you know are wrong and we know are wrong. Convict us of those times and drive us to repentance on our knees. Be our life. Come into our hearts and lives. Jesus, please do. We thank you. We praise you. In Holy Father's name, in your name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.